As you can see, we're going to participate in the Lord's Supper this morning. This is what's considered Easter weekend. We don't, well, this is about as early as Easter gets, isn't it? Do you know how Easter is decided every year? Constantine, way back in the 300s, and some of the bishops at the time managed to come up with a formula that is one of the most anti-Semitic things left in Christianity. Because you see, for the first two, three centuries, when the Christians would celebrate the resurrection, they celebrated it at Passover. When is Passover? It's always at a full moon because the month was from new moon to new moon and it's the 14th day of the month, which would be a full moon. Secondly, Passover was the first month of the year, which is the spring in the Jewish calendar. Thirdly, Passover had to be celebrated when there was a harvest of barley. The barley harvest had to be ready because the wave sheaf was waved on the, uh, what, what will we say, the, the third day of Passover. The Passover feast was kept in the evening at the full moon. Then there was a Sabbath. It could be any day of the week, but it was a, a Sabbath day. And then came the waving of the first fruits of the barley harvest. So what would happen is the Jewish rabbis would uh, go down from Jerusalem to the barley fields about the end of the month, the 12th month of the year, and they would check to see if the barley harvest was going to be ready in two weeks. And if it was, they would blow the trumpets and proclaim the first month of the year. If the barley harvest wasn't going to be ready, they'd blow the trumpets and proclaim a second twelfth month of the year. Because you do understand the lunar month is only 29 and a half days long, which means it gets out of sync with the seasons by two or three weeks every year. And so every two or three years, they'd have to have an extra twelfth month to get the first month in sync with the barley harvest. These are, this is the reason we do not know. Some people say we can. I think the research shows we cannot. There's no way that we can absolutely historically prove which day in the solar year Jesus actually died and exactly which year. There's a variance of about three years possibility and when did they proclaim the first, the extra 12th month? We don't know. You know, why would God keep it kind of obscure when is the exact day that Jesus died and rose again? Why would God do that? Because we turn it into a big celebration and that's the only time we go to church. Which is what most of the world has done, right? I find it interesting that God kept some things unknown because he wants us with him every day, not just on holidays, right? Anyway, so for the first three centuries or so, Christians, including Gentile Christians, celebrated the resurrection at the time that the Jews celebrated Passover. But when you get around to the time of Constantine and the church was becoming Roman and Gentile, Constantine, I've, I've actually read it this past week, Constantine makes this speech at a church council that says the Jews are the most vile race because they crucified Jesus. And that we do not want anything that we do as Christians to have anything at all to do with anything that the Jews do. Now that's going to be tough because we have the same Bible. But anyway, that's his point. And so we need to find a way that we always celebrate Easter at a different time than Passover, and we do not date it to have anything to do with Passover. By the way, that's also one of the reasons that things more from Sabbath keeping to Sunday keeping was getting away from looking like the Jews. Not biblical, just anti-Semitism. Now, generally speaking, well, no, let me, let me say that differently. Therefore, they came up with a formula that the keeping of 
Easter or the resurrection celebration would always be on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. You got that? Because you see, Passover would be at the first full moon often after the vernal equinox. The first or second full moon after the vernal equinox would be Passover. And so if it was the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox, they never correspond. This year's interesting because, let's see, what's the day today? 26th, okay? The vernal equinox is about the 21st, right? The full moon showed up right about the 21st, 22nd this year. And so now we have just about the earliest Passover you can have. Maybe a couple days earlier it could be. I don't know how they date, I'm, I'm sorry, earliest Easter. I don't know how they, I don't know how the Jewish world now f formulates when Passover is, but Passover isn't until the next full moon. We're actually going to celebrate a Passover as we do each year. Uh, we'll start announcing it next week, but it's going to be in about three weeks' time. Uh, we, we do it as a cultural experience and to experience what Jesus experienced at the Last Supper. It's actually interesting that we're coinciding today with communion with the weekend of Easter, which is an accident. Um, generally, Seventh-day Adventists, we, we uh, celebrate communion once a quarter. Jesus said, as often as you do it. He didn't say how often. So that's our custom. And it's usually the last week of the quarter or the first week of the new quarter. And so it just so happens that Easter weekend coincides with when we chose to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper today. The reality, though, is what we're celebrating today is kind of a, um, a reenactment of at least part of exactly what Jesus would have done at the last Passover before he was crucified. Jesus died as our Passover lamb. At the time of the slaying of the evening sacrifice, so he was a double symbol, the daily sacrifice and the Passover lamb. Passover commemorates when God delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt, and it prefigures when the Messiah will deliver all of us from the slavery of sin by the ultimate sacrifice. That's why when Jesus met in the upper room with his disciples, he took the emblems at the close of the Passover meal. And you'll know what I mean by that if you come to Passover here in about three weeks. At the close of the Passover meal, they'd already been celebrating for about two to two and a half hours, various rituals and things. And at the close, he took some of the Passover bread, the unleavened bread, and they'd already eaten and eat, been eating that bread through the meal. But he took some at the close and he broke it and he said, now... Eat this because this really represents my body. Now, they had been eating that bread for centuries looking forward to the coming of Messiah. So when Jesus says, eat this, this is my body, what's he saying? I'm it. Tonight, in the upper room, disciples, you are gathered around and we are experiencing the ultimate Passover supper because from now on, you will do this in remembrance of me, not anticipation of me. Jesus is saying, I am the Messiah. This is the pivotal point of the ages. We're going from before to after. Things will never be the same again. He also took the cup and said, do this in remembrance of me. They didn't understand it at the time. But within 24 hours, Jesus was in the grave. And they still didn't understand it until he rose. And it still took a while for it to sink in. Must have been interesting for those Jewish disciples who had all of their life kept Passover in anticipation of something to cross that threshold and be the ones who now shifted their thinking to celebrating in remembrance of the great event. And of course, we eat and drink in remembrance. 
One other thing we do as Seventh-day Adventists is the Bible says that in the upper room they were having an argument over who was going to be the greatest. John, the youngest, wrangled himself into sitting on the right side of Jesus, which was the highest place of honor. Judas apparently got himself on the left side, which was the second place of honor. And while they're going through the Passover festivities for a couple of hours, there's an argument going on. Luke tells us about who is going to be the greatest. It says then that supper being ended. So we're two hours into this thing at least. Jesus finally got up and wrapped a towel around his waist, got a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. The reality is the foot washing should have happened when they entered the room a servant should have washed everyone's feet. And in the absence of a servant, the youngest, the bottom of the pecking order person in the room should have washed everybody else's feet. So what were the disciples arguing for over who was going to be the greatest? They were really arguing over who was not going to wash feet. Right? That was the big point. Who was not going to be the leastest? And finally, Jesus gets up, washes their feet, sits back down, and says, Do you guys have a clue what I've done for you? I am your Lord and Master. I'm the boss. Jesus, at the beginning of chapter 13 of the book of John, says he knew exactly who he was. He knew he'd come from God. He knew he was going back to God. Knowing exactly who he is, he washes their feet. And then he says, do you guys understand what's happened? I am the top. I am the boss. I am the creator. I am the Lord. And if I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, why in the world don't you guys wash each other's feet? What was this argument about anyway? Who's going to be the greatest? The one who is great in my kingdom is the one who serves in the kingdom of heaven we do not claw our way to the top we dig our way to the bottom everybody's trying to get below and serve everybody else it's a scramble to the bottom and Jesus says happy are you if you do as I have done if I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Now, washing feet in Western culture is a little bit weird. It's uncomfortable. It's odd. And it's good for us. Because before we come to the table and are able to fully accept the blessing of Jesus giving his life for us, the body and the blood. We need to humble ourselves and bless and serve one another and recognize that the kingdom of God is a scramble to the bottom. We need to stoop and serve. No matter how uncomfortable it is, it's a blessing. You need it. We need it. And so we come to the table. Three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, talk about the table where Jesus took the bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. What is the new covenant versus the old covenant? There's a number of views on that. There's a number of views. Some, you know, the old covenant was works. We had to be saved by keeping the law. And now the new covenant, praise the Lord, we're under grace. We don't have to keep that law anymore. A heart of love never give laws, gives laws that would be detrimental to living and you would be better off without them. Jesus said, I didn't come to change the law. Not one dot of an I or cross of a T will pass from it. The old covenant simply said, Messiah will come 
and save us from our sins. The new covenant simply says, Messiah came and saved us from our sins. The old covenant looks forward to the event. Therefore, the event hasn't happened yet. Therefore, the event is only a promise, right? The New Covenant looks back on what has happened. It's no longer a promise, it's a reality. Now, a promise with God is as good as a reality, amen? He says he'll do something, nothing can stop him from doing it. You know, we make a promise, we could keel over from a heart attack and not be able to fulfill it. You know, we could somehow have the car break down and we don't show up. You know, all kinds of things can happen beyond our control to keep us from fulfilling some promises. Nothing can happen to keep God from fulfilling his promises. Amen? So when he says, I will come and save you, the old covenant, we know it's as good as in the bank. And yet there is a way that the new covenant is better than the old because it is in the bank. There's nothing in the universe that can reverse or undo the fact that Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose, it's done. And that's what makes the new covenant better, is it's in the bank. It has happened. We look back at a reality, we don't look forward to a promise. Again, with God, it's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever, right? But from a human standpoint, this is a better covenant because it's done. It is finished. And so we celebrate a crucified and risen Lord. We have bread. Jesus says, this is my body broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. We have grape juice. This is my blood of the new covenant. Drink it in remembrance of me. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day that I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus is on a grape juice fast because he's looking forward to when we have, what, the first supper. <laughs> together in the kingdom of God. Amen? And he's holding off till then. But he says, in the meantime, you go ahead. Partake and partake in remembrance of me, but also, therefore, in anticipation of when we will eat and drink together in the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes we think of heaven as being kind of pie in the sky by and by, you know? We're all going to wear a white robe and have to walk really carefully so we don't get grass stains on it. You know, and everybody's just kind of smiling and just, you know, just eternally happy. And, and you look at pictures of heaven and you wonder, where's the adventure? It's like everything's so stately. I like the idea that we're going to have food in heaven. Isn't that right? There's something about food. Some of us think there's too much about food. But we were made to enjoy food. And one of the things Jesus says is we're going to sit down and eat and drink in the kingdom of God. Real people living real lives. Yesterday I was eating supper with my wife and these thoughts crossed my mind. I didn't say them during supper. Um, we have a a tangelo tree and you know you go out and grab a few tangelos and bring them in and you'll eat one have you noticed every tangelo tastes different it tastes like a tangelo but it tastes different and I ate a little one that was like it was really small and it was like all the flavor of a gigantic one was in that little one it was just really marvelous and then I ate a larger one and, and it was really good and then they ate another one, and it was kind of flat, you know? And I remember thinking, I wonder what our food tastes like now compared to what it tastes like in Eden. 
Now, I love when Marilyn does a crock pot of, what do they call them, butter beans, like big lima beans. Those are so good. So I was eating some of those, and I was thinking, I wonder what these tasted like when they were perfect. I mean, they're really good now. And I'll bet you if we had the flavor from the beginning, we'd say these are really flat, right? Things are going to be on steroids, exponential, when we get to the kingdom of God. And so we eat and drink in anticipation of what is to come. It's in the book of 1 Corinthians that Paul gives some instruction to the church in Corinth about the Lord's Supper. When we read that, we discover that the Lord's Supper was probably handled quite differently back then than now. It was more like a dinner together, like a potluck lunch or a potluck supper. And food was provided, and somehow as part of that event, like in the upper room at the Passover, then maybe at the close of the meal, the people would participate in the emblems and remember the Lord's Supper. And Paul tell, tells the people in Corinth they've got it all wrong because some of them are going through potluck line and loading their plates with food and the last people in line there's nothing left and he gets after him he says come on this is not about a feast in that way don't 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 eat and drink most everything and then somebody goes without this is a time to share he also talks to them about the fact that some of them are eating and drinking in an unworthy manner and drinking and eating condemnation we practice an open communion anybody is welcome to come to the table whether you're a member of this church or not Jesus is open to all amen but think about it this way in a moment when you eat that piece of bread what are you saying by eating it You are making a statement of faith. You are saying, I believe that I'm a sinner that needs forgiveness. I need Jesus in me for life. So by eating this bread, you're saying, I'm accepting Jesus as my very life. And then by drinking the grape juice, you're saying, I accept the fact that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I recognize that the only way to salvation is through the blood of Jesus Christ. So if you don't believe that, then you shouldn't participate because, as Paul says, you're eating and drinking damnation to yourself. Because you see, if, if you don't actually believe this, the reality is by participating, you're actually recognizing that this is not for you. <laughs> And that you are not, uh, well, the reverse. In other words, if you do not accept Jesus, you're not headed for life. You're headed for death. So that's why Paul says, eat it in a worthy manner. None of us are worthy of the blood of Jesus Christ or his body. Unless we simply recognize we need it. That makes you worthy. Amen? Do we need it? So Paul says, then it's his instruction to the Corinthians. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.